the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Jesus Christ. May I speak to you this morning in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, and uh, pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to see so many of you joining us live uh, from our parking lot in Lawrence. This, uh, I am just so encouraged. Uh, a very good morning to you. Uh, a good morning to those of you joining uh, us online, uh, whether you're in Lawrence or you're around the world. Uh, I hope that uh, as you come and you worship with us here at St. Margaret's, you can sense that God is in this place um, and God is the one who is keeping us going. I want to start off this morning uh, telling you a story about uh, something that happened in April of 1963. April 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other leaders of the Southern Christian Leadership Council were busy helping to lead the Birmingham campaign. Uh, that was a movement dedicated to shining a spotlight on efforts by civil rights leaders to integrate the city of Birmingham, Alabama. Shortly after he defied a city ordinance regarding permits for public gatherings, Dr. King was jailed for his work with the Birmingham campaign. It was while he was in jail that he had received word of criticism from moderate members of the clergy over their protests. Lots of Americans in 1963 were critical of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his work, so much so that he obviously didn't have time to respond to every criticism and every critique. But he felt like this critique from his colleagues merited a response. And so writing on scraps of newspaper and other bits of paper that he could get his hands on, on April 16, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. composed what has now become a classic work. Many of us read it in high school and in college uh, classes. Letter from Birmingham Jail. The letter touches on a number of very important themes, including the distinction between just and unjust laws, the duty of Christians to practice civil disobedience when necessary, and the deep connections that compelled Dr. King to travel from his home in Atlanta, Georgia, all the way to the city of Birmingham, Alabama. It was on this last point that Dr. King wrote, I think, probably his most well-known words. Dr. King justified his visit to Birmingham by recalling the prophets of the Hebrew Scriptures, as well as the Apostle Paul who all left their homes to do the work that God had set before them. Dr. King also pointed out a basic truth about the ties that bind us all. He wrote this, I'll quote him. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny." End quote. Although our, our world has changed quite a bit since April of 1963, I find Dr. King's words to be as relevant and as timely as ever. After all, we are living in an age of increasing isolation, where every day our culture tries to convince us that the only things that matter are the things we can see. And thus, life is a matter of catering to the individual. My wants and desires your wants and desires. While this ethic of self-realization might feel good for a season, I'm convinced that many of us find in the end such a way to be dissatisfying. 
our hearts hunger for belonging. Our spirits thirst for a sense of the transcendent. We want desperately to believe, like Dr. King, that there is something more that's out there, something that's binding us to each other and ultimately to God. I'm going to turn now to um, the epistle reading that we heard a few moments ago. Um, I've really enjoyed these past several weeks exploring uh, a, a pretty large section of Paul's letter to the Philippians. I mentioned, I think it was a couple of weeks ago now, that uh, Philippians is uh, often kind of colloquially uh, referred to as the epistle of joy. This morning, Paul really drives that message home for us. We heard a few moments ago Paul telling his followers to be glad in the Lord. Other versions often say rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. After instructing us to rejoice, uh, Paul then tells his followers, his hearers, and us as well, not to be anxious, not to worry about anything, but rather to offer to God our prayers and petitions with thanksgiving. So what's Paul doing this morning in our text? He's kind of painting an image for us. He's painting an image of a practice. And another way, if, if I can try and explain what that image might look like. And another way you, you, you might describe it, you might see it as two sides of a seesaw. Paul is, is telling us this morning that as we, we lead lives increasingly marked by joy, we can let go of the anxieties that seem to press in on every side. Another image you might have for this is, is one of breathing. Paul wants us to breathe in joy and to exhale anxiety over and over again until it becomes second nature, trusting all this time that God's peace will keep us secure. It's a wonderful image. It's compelling. Uh, although I just have to say, and, and I don't think I'm speaking only for myself when I say this, I have to say that there's sort of an uncomfortable truth that I grapple with when I read a text like this. Listening to these words, I think something to the effect of, while all this sounds like a fine idea, how can we actually put this into practice, looking around at our world and seeing everything that we're confronting? I mean, after all, our world is a mess. And lately, it seems to be a bigger mess than ever. In 2020, the reasons for worry and anxiety are inexhaustible. And the causes for joy are all too rare. So we might ask, and I think it's a rather compelling question, if Paul were around today, would he write the same words? Could he write the same words? I want to answer that question, and to do it, I think it's important to maybe take a step back and think a little bit about the context for Paul's letter to the Philippians. Although we can't determine the precise location of the letter's writing, what is clear is that Paul is writing from prison. A lot like Dr. King, Paul is writing from the confines of a cell, and he too is in the final season of his life. Instead of Birmingham, Alabama, though, Paul is likely writing from the city of Rome. And that's the place where he would eventually face martyrdom. It's for this reason, it's for this context that surrounds Paul as he dictated his letter to those believers in Philippi that the book of Philippians has such a distinctive tone. It's one that's really difficult to summarize neatly. In one sense, yes, it is the great epistle of joy. 
a work that is profoundly encouraging to read and to reflect upon. And yet, other parts of Philippians are often serious, even somber. Throughout the letter, Paul is aware of and at peace with his mortality. He has already suffered much for the sake of the gospel. And in the second chapter of the letter, he even describes himself as being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice of the believers that were there in Philippi. Pain, setback, uncertainty, imprisonment, martyrdom. By the time Paul wrote his letter to the Philippians, these things had become the very hallmarks of his life. The circumstances surrounding the composition of Philippians were overwhelming, far beyond the emotional capacity that I hold. And so my suspicion is this. If Paul were here today in the year 2020, he would write these same words again. In fact, I'm convinced that Paul has a word for us this morning. And the encouragement is a simple one, and this is what I want you to hear from me. Paul wants us to know that joy is not a matter of circumstance. Rather, true joy, a joy that comes from God alone, is meant to keep us going despite our circumstance. In other words, joy is not the gift of being ahead. It's not the feeling like things are falling into place. Joy, rather, is the gift of trusting that it is God who sustains us, both through our triumphs as well as our trials. I say this a lot, but I think it bears repeating. I have no idea what the rest of 2020 is going to bring. I don't know what the month of October is going to bring. Uh, we are surrounded on every side by so much to lament and so much hardship. And so every day I feel like as a community and as individuals, we're faced with a choice. We can embrace an all too understandable despair or we can embrace a defiant and stubborn joy. And yet, if we want to get to joy, we have to bind ourselves to a reality deeper than what we experience through our senses. We have to bind ourselves to the idea that our destinies really are caught up with each other's. We have to bind ourselves to the conviction that God's goodness and grace are the things that we really do need most in this world regardless of circumstance. Experts say that the heart of a sermon uh, should never be an imperative. Do this, don't do that. But rather a proclamation. Hear this. So I want to close my sermon by sharing this piece of good news with you. It's the good news that Paul shared with those followers of Jesus in Philippi, and it's good news for us. My brothers and sisters, God is near. Even when, especially when everything good and beautiful in this world feels so far away, God is near. Feelings are fickle. They come and they go. Joy may feel easy one day and difficult the next, but God's goodness can and never will be shaken. In an act of unspeakable grace, God came near to us in a person, Jesus Christ. And Jesus promised us that he was going to remain with us always to the very end of the age. God is near. 
Because of Jesus, God's offer to us is forgiveness and healing and hope. And God's way is redemption, love, and joy. God is near. Today, tomorrow, and always. Amen.